on next week. Come go over, come and go over exam one to fix your mistakes. Those are my office hours. If you can't make those, I am typically in my office in Provo before 12, after 1.30 on Monday. Often on Wednesday, I have a 1.30 meeting, but I don't this week. So if you want to come go over the exam or ask questions, and it's not my office hours, uh, I'll knock on my door and see if I'm there. Take advantage of when you come. Okay, I'm entering recitation scores. Do you know that all late recitations get 90%, right? So if you have a recitation that isn't handed in, it's not too late. It's worth doing for the credit and it's worth doing for the understanding that thinking through those things gives you. If I have entered a zero and you still wanna upload your recitation for late credit, go for it and I will check where final grades are assigned to make sure that I haven't missed any of those. Okay. If there's a zero out of 10 on one of them, but it's submitted, do you think that's, that's not supposed to be, is it? I think, well, I think a lot of us have that. Some of the so learning suite has a setting where it, it assigns zero after a certain deadline. And I looked at those this morning. And I, I think I'm only up through six. So it's from my end, I didn't see any of those. I will go check again. It's possible that it doesn't look the same on your end. Obviously, if you have it submitted, you shouldn't have. Okay, so we're talking about equilibrium, right? And what we're really talking about is what happens in chemical reactions. And what we can tell about chemical reactions is that some reactions come to equilibrium with a lot of product and some come to equilibrium with not very much product at all, right? How do we tell for a given reaction how much product we're going to get? The equilibrium constant, right? Equilibrium constant tells us, do we get a lot of product at equilibrium or not very much product? Okay, so if we know the equilibrium constant, we know the starting concentration, we can have kind of a gut feel about where the equilibrium will lie. We'll have a lot of product or not very much product, but we can also mathematically solve to figure out exactly what we have. Are you seeing the trend here? We talked about the concepts. We use the constants and the equations to summarize the concept in general terms, and also we use those equations to calculate actual numbers. Okay, here we have a fairly typical, maybe a little bit ugly, equilibrium problem. So we have this reaction that produces sulfur trioxide. The equilibrium constant is 417. Okay. And we start the reaction with uh, initial sulfur dioxide 0 0.033 atmospheres of pressure. What's notable about this? It's all product. Can we do that? Mm -hmm. Sure. Okay, there's some questions for you. What side will the equilibrium be on? Okay, Josh says the right. How come? How do you know? The K value is like big. K value is big. We should end up with about 420 times more product than starting with zero. Roughly depends on what the coefficients are. Okay. Can we start the process? What's the value of Q? Kind of a trick question. So Q is defined as the concentration of products raised to the stoichiometric coefficient divided by the concentration, or in this case, pressure of starting materials raised to their coefficients. Can we actually calculate a number for Q when we start? No. We have zero in the denominator. If you take a number divided by zero, what do you get? You get an undefined number. So we can't calculate an actual value of Q, but what do we know here? 
if we compare Q and K, do we have, are we at equilibrium here? Are we to the left of equilibrium or to the right of equilibrium? We're to the right of equilibrium because we have all product. And the equilibrium constant says, well, we're gonna have some starting material. So from these conditions, the reaction is gonna run what direction? It's gonna to run to the left. We'll use up some products to make starting materials. Okay, how far to the left is the reaction gonna run from these conditions? It's a little bit, right? But we don't have to have very much starting material to satisfy. Okay. So what does our rice table look like? Set up the reaction. And in, for these conditions, we don't have any starting material, which is different than kind of you've seen them, but we can do it that way. We can start with our partial pressure of our product. Okay, since we know the reaction is gonna move backwards in the change line, we're actually going to have some of our product get used up. So we have a negative 2x for the product, positive x and 2x for the sulfur dioxide. Okay, so the equilibrium, we end up with this. How do we tell your neighbor how you would solve the problem from here? When we take our equilibrium expression and substitute in the values from the equilibrium line from our rice table, we get something pretty ugly. We're actually going to end up with a cubic expression. Can we use the quadratic formula to solve for that? No. Okay. So we have to have a simplifying assumption so that if we, can, if we just have something x cubed equals numbers, then we can solve for x by taking the cube root. But we can't have all the x squared and x yuck that we have by subtracting the 2x here. Okay. How big is the x going to be? Small. It's going to be really small. Okay. So can we assume that x is the 2x is small enough that when you subtract it from 0.033, it doesn't show up in the significant figures? Yeah, you can. So we do that. We neglect x in the denominator, which means that this expression, 0 0.033 minus 2x, is pretty much the same as just 0 0.033, right? So we rewrite it, not x, out. Now, in the past, we've talked about neglecting x in the denominator, right? Is this the denominator? It's the numerator. How come we can do this? The point of neglecting x is that you can you neglect it when you're adding it to or subtracting it from another number. So when the x is so much smaller than the number you're adding it to or subtracting it from that it makes no difference, then we can leave it out. Okay, when we do this, now we just have a cubic expression. Can we solve this? So we get 4x cubed equals a bunch of numbers. x cubed equals that. Take the square root and we get x. Okay, once we get x, what does it tell us? I have a question. Ask your question. Um, how do we know that x is small? Because usually we have x is small when k is small. Okay. X is small when K is sm small when the reaction is moving forward. So it's, it's not the, the reaction isn't progressing very far. We're actually doing the same thing here, but the reaction is progressing backwards from all product. So X is still small because K is large. So we can neglect it. We can assume that X is small and can be neglected when K is small and the reaction is moving forward but the backwards process also applies. So when K is large, reaction is moving backwards. It still can be small because we don't have to move it backwards very far to get to equilibrium. Yeah. Okay. 
once you solve for x and all of your concentrations, how do you check to make sure that you didn't just do some silly out and common algebraic blunder? I'll get back in. So once you solve, you're going to solve for the property of the marble gases. Plug it into your equilibrium expression again, and what should you get back out? Calculated the right partial pressures. Okay. It always pains me on the short answer section of the exam. When someone has set up their stuff about the right way, come up with the wrong number. Does that ever happen? It happens to me. Okay. And then they didn't check it, so they couldn't fix it. So I didn't get to give them the full credit. And I know from looking at their test that they could have fixed it if they checked, because clearly they were setting it up the right way. And I'm sad. And then I hand the test back to you, and you're sad. Um, go through the trouble of checking the numbers you get at, at at the end to make sure that you get k. Now, that doesn't work every time. If I have the wrong k expression, if I forget to square something, something like that, you're still going to come up with the wrong answer. But if you set up your k expression appropriately, that should help you. Okay, last week, we talked about the idea that the equilibrium constant tells you how much product you're going to get at equilibrium. But there are things we can do or tweak in a reaction to maximize the amount that we get for a given reaction. So it comes from this idea of Le Chatelier's principle. Le Chatelier's principle says, for any equilibrium, apply stress to one side of the reaction and you'll affect, you'll move the reaction towards the other side. So what does that actually mean? Okay, a stress would be a change in concentration or a change in pressure or a change in temperature, right? Okay. If I increase the concentration of starting materials, what side of the reaction am I stressing? Well, if I'm adding starting materials, I'm stressing the starting material side. So what happens? It pushes to the other side and makes product. If I take away starting materials, what does that do? It's the opposite of adding starting materials. So what's going to happen? It pushes the reaction back towards the side of starting materials. Okay, change in temperature works similarly. The whole idea of the Chatelier's principle is based on what we talked about last time. And that is, every reaction wants to go towards equilibrium, right? And it wants to go to, to an equilibrium where the concentrations are such that they match the K value, right? Now, if you have not enough we have this idea called reaction quotient, right? What's reaction quotient? So we can calculate the K value according to a certain formula, right? And we can calculate the Q value and the formula looks the same. So what's the difference between P and Q? Q is at a certain moment in time or a certain set of concentrations, and K is at equilibrium. So the K expression only applies for the concentrations that you're going to get at equilibrium when that reaction comes to And Q could be at any point in the reaction progress. So you could have not enough starting material. You could have too much starting material. Okay. Or if you are at equilibrium, and what do you know about Q and K? They're the same, right? So if we stop and we say, okay, what's Q? If we have too much starting material and or not enough product, then Q is gonna be less than K, right? And then the reaction is gonna move forward to produce more product and use that starting materials until we get to equilibrium. If you have too much product or not enough starting material, then the reaction is going to compensate by moving left towards equilibrium. Okay. Talier's principle talks about things that affect 
the difference between Q and K. So the Chautauquais principle really talks about what's the difference between Q and K. Here's a little chemical history lesson. If Le Chatelier's principle is really about Q and K and what that does to the equilibrium, why are we still talking about Le Chatelier's principle? Why did Le Chatelier come up with his ideas? Early, early. So Le Chatelier's principles have been known for, he was probably, certainly from before that, before, uh, the atom was made. But we still talk about Le Chatelier's principle because chemists have been talking about it for generations, even before Q and K were understood. So now you're smarter than Le Chatelier, right? He's famous. We name a principle after him, but you understand the principle, why it is the way it is and why it works better than he did. Okay. So what are things we can do that are stresses? We can change the concentration of product and reactant. Which does that change? That changes Q. <laughs> Q changes. How does the reaction respond? It moves in the direction that it has to go to to get to K. So if we add a lot more starting material, what's going to happen? We're going to end up with more product. Yeah. Do you remember... I can't remember if we talked about this last time. Stoichiometry calculations in Chem 105, limiting reagents and excess reagents. Why would you set up a reaction with an excess reagent? We can talk about that in 105, right? We just threw problems at you and said, calculate the theoretical yield, right? Well, if one reagent is in excess, what does that do to the amount of product that you end up with? Hey, ladder. It makes it bigger. It makes it bigger. So if you're running a reaction on the bench top and you want to get a lot of product, one way is to add more of everything, right? But you really only have to add more of one starting material to get more product. Because of Le Chatelier's principle and equilibrium and Q and K, you'll get a larger amount of product made just by putting one of the reagents. So those stoichiometry calculations, that's where that comes from. It shifts Q, but also K, right? When you change the concentration. Of... Okay. Does anyone want to answer Josh's question? <laughs> K is a constant. <coughs> so when we add more starting material, we're only changing Q. We're changing the Q that we start with, right? And if we start with a Q that's, say, much, much smaller than K, the reaction is going to have to proceed farther to get to the equilibrium. So you'll get more product. So it doesn't shift the equilibrium. Yeah, so adding an excess reagent or extra starting material doesn't shift the equilibrium. Does it give you different values for the equilibrium concentrations? You do. The actual numbers end up different. But when you put them into the expression, you still get the equilibrium constant back again. Okay, so if I add more starting material, what happens to Q? It goes down. It goes down. When Q is more smaller than K, what happens to how hard the reaction wants to move forward? It wants to move forward more. How far does it have to move forward to get the equilibrium? has to move more forward to get to the equilibrium position, and so you end up with more product. Okay, <laughs> if you add more product, what happens to Q? If it's bigger, right? If Q is bigger, close. suppose you're not at equilibrium left. Yeah, you didn't add enough Q to get to equilibrium, but you're closer, right? So what happens to how much product? Still going to shift right, but not as far. Yeah. Okay, how about if you take product out as it forms? So if I have some way of removing the product as it forms, suppose it precipitates as a solid and goes down to the bottom of the, of the material. It comes out of solution. Or suppose it's a gas and I can bubble it off and capture it. 
What happens to Q? It stays low. It stays low. So normally, Q gets smaller and smaller as the reaction progresses because that product is there, right? And it's growing in concentration. If you can remove the product as it forms, what happens to Q? The reaction proceeds, and what happens to Q? It doesn't get any bigger. So what happens to the reaction? It keeps going until what? Until you run out of starting material. So you can you find a way to tweak that to keep the reaction going. You have reactions in your body that work that way. So there are chemical reactions in metabolism that actually aren't that favorable. The equilibrium doesn't lie that way. <coughs> once the product is made, what happens to it? It's get used up in a, in a subsequent reaction, right? So the reaction that produced it just keeps on going because Q never reaches K. Okay. How about temperature? Oh, when you change the temperature, what happens to K? It changes. So K, an equilibrium constant value only applies at a single temperature. If you change the temperature, you're not going to have the same K value anymore. Okay, how come? Two ways to think about this. One is to say, according to Le Talier's principle, reactions are typically either endothermic or exothermic. We don't typically have a delta H value that's zero. Okay, so if our delta H value is positive, what does that say about the reaction? So it's taking heat energy in, and that heat energy that is incorporated into the potential energies of the product molecules. Okay, if we raise the temperature, what are we doing to the amount of heat available to that reaction? It goes up, right? So we're actually treating heat like a reactant for an endothermic reaction. If we raise the temperature, what side of the reaction are we stressing? Starting material side, so what's gonna happen? Equilibrium is gonna to move towards product. But in this case, what we're actually influencing is K, not Q. So if the equilibrium shifts towards the right, how does that show up as in a K value? Mm -hmm. Just a little bit, it Hold that thought. If you shift to the right, you end up with more product at equilibrium, right? So K actually goes up because the more, more you get, more product you get at equilibrium, K value is higher, okay? So we haven't shifted Q by changing the temperature, right? We just changed K. But if we change K, are we changing the difference between Q and K? Sure we are. And that still helps the reaction move. Okay, so for an endothermic reaction, if we increase the temperature, what happens to K? That. For an exothermic reaction, heat is given off like it's a product. So if we raise the temperature, what happens to our K value? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, keep in mind, everything that we're talking about here has to do with Q and K and what that does to how the reaction is gonna proceed. Temperature changes. K, which does change the difference between Q and K. Everything else changes Q. Okay, so we have this equilibrium constant tells us how much product can form. Okay, so K tells us when it comes to equilibrium. Tells us which way the reaction wants to end up. We also, in 105, and briefly here in this class, talked about Gibbs free energy delta G, right? What does delta G tell you? Okay, Chem 105 definition. Ali did a good one. Delta G tells you whether a reaction is spontaneous. What does that mean, spontaneous? Where it will happen on its own. Really, what delta G tells you is. Is the reaction wanting to move forward or not? What Chem 105 called a spontaneous reaction is just one that wants to move in the forward direction. Now you're smarter than you were in Chem 105. Just because a reaction wants to move forward and has a negative delta G, does that give you any indication about how long it will take? No. So there are reactions 
that want to move forward but have such a high energy of activation that they're so slow that we practically don't see them. But delta G can be used to assess does something want to move forward or not. Okay, so what are we here today to do? We conceptually have talked about how Q and K and delta G tell you something about what's going to happen. Is the reaction going to move forward? Is the reaction going to move backward, right? And you use the K value to calculate what your final concentrations will be at equilibrium. Okay. Have you noticed in this class that where there is a conceptual link between ideas, there is also a mathematical link between those ideas? Good or a bad thing? It's frustrating because that means there's more math, right? But it's beautiful and profound because all the concepts are summarized by the equations. So you need a conceptual sheet sheet. Did I say that? <laughs> I don't think so. If you need a conceptual cheat sheet, the equations are it. You just have to learn how to read the equations. Okay, so today we're going to talk about the mathematical equations that relate those things. And since we've talked about how equilibrium constant changes with temperature, there's actually a really fairly straightforward equation approach to tell us how it changes with temperature. Um, that doesn't mean that it's happy making to use some of those equations to actually get, actually get the numbers. But I think that you'll be shocked at how straightforward it is to understand where those equations come from if you haven't encountered that before. Okay, make sure that you know the language and the firm ground. So Chem 105 and 106, we talked about, well, Chem 105, and now again in 106, we talked about the first and second laws of thermodynamics. So what's the first law of thermodynamics? Tell your neighbor or ask them. <laughs> How do we typically apply the first law of thermodynamics in chemistry? There is an absolute <laughs> top common way that we use the first law of thermodynamics over and over. This is what we do. We say energy is conserved. Molecules change their potential energy typically as they move from starting material to products, right? Where does that potential and where does that difference in energy between starting materials and products come from or where does it go? Does that make sense? <laughs> It goes to heat transfer to and from the surroundings. So any change in the potential energy of the molecules between starting materials and, and products is accompanied by a heat transfer so that the total change in energy is zero. Okay, if heat is given off in a reaction, energy is given up, what does that mean about the potential energy of the molecules? It had to go down, and the amount that it went down is given off as heat. Okay. If heat is taken into a reaction, an endothermic reaction, that means that the heat that was taken in, where does it go? It's incorporated into the energy of the bond. So when you take heat in in an endothermic reaction, that heat becomes increased potential energy of the molecules themselves. So what we're actually seeing when we talk about the first law of the dynamics in chemistry is heat being converted to potential energy of molecules or potential energy of molecules being converted to heat that, that is then given off. So that's when in chemistry, when we talk about the first law of the dynamics, what we're really talking about is energy diagrams. We're talking about what's the difference in potential energy between starting to Okay, second law of thermodynamics. In words, or any process that occurs, the total change in entropy of the universe is going to go up, or delta S of the universe is positive. Every spontaneous process occurs with a total increase in entropy. Well, what's entropy other than a word that nobody actually ever wants to talk about? The common way, the physical science 100 is to call it disorder as if it was messiness. Is that really accurate? 
what it really is, is the number of possible choices. So a perfectly ordered system with zero entropy is where everything can only exist one way. So for example, if you take a molecule, cool it down to absolute zero so that it's stuck in place, there's no bond, vib bond vibrations or rotations, it's just stuck there. That, there's only one choice for how that molecule can be arranged, right? So that's a zero entropy condition. Anything we do that results in more options for a molecule or a system results in an increase. Okay, so we can calculate the total entropy by taking Boltzmann's constant times the log of the total number of arrangements for a given state. Are you ever going to have to do that? You didn't even have to do that in 105. No, you don't have to know that. But you do have to understand that the more the possible arrangements, the greater the entropy which means it's more likely to happen. Okay, mathematically, we can express the second law of thermodynamics by saying the change in entropy total, which is for the universe, is equal to the change in entropy for the system and plus the change in entropy for the surroundings. When we're talking chemical reactions, what is our system typically? The reactants. The reactants and the products. The system are the molecules. What's the surroundings? Everything else. Okay. So this delta S of the system, that's just the change in entropy between the starting materials and the products. Do you remember in Chem 105 that you calculated delta S naught? It's mean in standard molar entropy by calculating the total entropy for the product molecules and subtracting the total entropy for the starting molecules. Or have you locked that in a deep, dark closet that you never want to revisit? <laughs> It's some of both, right? This delta S of the system is what we calculated. Come on, slide. Okay, so what kinds of things correspond to different? Anytime there's more molecular movement, there's more choices for where the molecules can be. So entropy goes up. So the gas has higher entropy than salt. Uh, if you increase the temperature, what happens to the molecules? get more bond vibration, they have a little more mobility. So increasing the temperature results in increasing entropy. And something that's important is that different kinds of, en of energy have different amounts of entropy associated with them. So uh, if you take chemical potential energy in a molecule, there's a certain amount of entropy associated with the stability of the molecule as a function of bond rotation and vibration and some other things. Um, if you take that same amount of energy in joules and convert it to heat, there's more entropy associated with that same amount of energy as heat. So anytime we take chemical potential energy and release it as heat, change it to heat, what happens to the total entropy? Close up. Okay. So we don't ever use this equation, hardly ever in chemistry. It is a, it is a Summary of the second law of thermodynamics. But the problem is, if we're if we're thinking about the change in entropy that's total for the universe, we have to talk about what's happening in the system and what's happening in the surroundings. It's awfully hard to measure the surroundings. It's a lot easier to measure the system. And so what chemists have done is to come up with a way to restate that equation using terms that are only from the system. That's what the Gibbs free energy equation is. So we are obsessed with delta G, right? Or maybe you're not, but I am, right? Obsessed with delta G, why? Because when delta G is negative, what does that tell us about delta S for the universe? So delta G of the system actually equals minus T delta S of the universe. So when delta G is negative, what do we know about the entropy of the universe? It's going to go up. And from the second law of thermodynamics, what is thermodynamics? What does that say about the process? We want to move forward. So we're kind of obsessed with delta G because when delta G is negative, what does that mean? The process is pushing forwards. Okay, 
So, we know what's going to happen in a reaction by looking at delta G, right? Yes, I'm seeing. I recommend when you want to convince yourself that you're doing homework, but you really can't bring yourself to actually do homework. Have you ever had one of those moments? On train, maybe. And watch the video. So the video is this Canadian science guy who does the best videos ever. And he is thinking about entropy. So he just recorded a bazillion processes that only happen in one direction. Things that have directionality from entropy. And because we're so used to seeing these things happen in only one direction, he then reversed the film. So he's actually lip syncing to a, a song. He's singing it forwards, but on the on the video, he had to actually learn how to say all the words backwards. Try to have it match the soundtrack. Doesn't work perfectly, but it's pretty good. Anyway, the song is about the arrow of time. Why would entropy be the arrow of time? Time only goes in one direction in our experience, right? Time only goes in one direction because Otherwise, the second law of thermodynamics would be violated. Things only move in one direction. They can only move in the direction that increases the entropy of the universe. If we were to travel back in time or run time backwards, what would happen to the entropy of the universe? It would shrink. That can't happen. But one way of understanding why time only moves in one direction for us is to say that as mortal human beings, we are governed by the second law of thermodynamics and our experience with entropy has to always increase. Now, I do have a question about the second law of thermodynamics and that is, I'm not convinced that it applies to the Lord or to resurrected bodies. So on my list of questions to ask the Lord when I stand in front of him is, what about the second law? Okay. Isn't that a valid question? <laughs> it's one of our moral constraints. It governs everything that happens in mortality. Does it have to apply to the Lord? We can have a resurrected body that doesn't behave. Maybe the second law doesn't apply outside the constraints of Maybe I shouldn't have the Gibbs free energy tattooed on my body, right? <laughs> Maybe it's not an eternal enough principle. Okay. So look at the equation and see what it means. Delta G is a representation or one way of thinking about what's going to happen to the entropy of the universe when something happens. Okay. Delta G just tells you what's happening under the conditions that you have, right? So as a reaction proceeds forwards, as it gets closer and closer to equilibrium, what happens to delta G? It shrinks and gets zero, gets finally to zero at equilibrium, right? So delta G is like a little snapshot that tells you how much the process wants to move forward at the moment. Think about what the equation means. Delta H, in physical terms, what does delta H tell you? Exo or endothermic. It tells you if it's exo or endothermic. And what does that tell you? It tells you whether heat is coming from the surroundings and being incorporated into an increase in potential energy of the molecules, or if the molecules are converting themselves to more stable products at lower potential energy and then giving off that excess energy. So delta H, that actually tells you, are we going to higher potential energy or lower potential energy? Why would the delta H affect the entropy of the universe? Is there a difference in entropy between chemical potential energy and heat? Yeah, there is. So anytime we're changing chemical potential energy to heat or from heat, Go up into okay, why, and then obviously this delta S of the system, the entropy of the molecules themselves is going to 
Keep in mind, temperature is a term in the Gibbs free energy equation, right? So when we change the temperature, what happens to delta G? It changes, right? Is that consistent with what you know about delta, uh, the temperature changing the K value? Yeah, exactly. I know you're getting tired of me asking these questions, but I need it to be embedded in your very skin. If the reaction is proceeding forward, what's delta G? Okay, so delta G is negative when we have too much starting material, right? Okay. If it's proceeding to the left, what do we have too much of? Product. Product. So what's the sign of delta G then? Positive. And equilibrium? Okay, other than the fact that you memorize that delta G is zero at equilibrium, does it make sense that delta G would have to be zero at equilibrium? At equilibrium, there's no push forward and there's no push backwards, right? So delta G has to be zero. Okay, so think about what this means. We have an equilibrium constant, k equals one. This is like the simplest option that I can give you. One starting material is converted to product, k is one. What will the equilibrium look like when we're done? You know something about the relative amounts of starting material and product when you get to equilibrium. Tell your neighbor what it is. <laughs> it's constant. <laughs> yeah. I concur. Well, what number they are is what the over one papers No matter what you start with, when you get to equilibrium, the concentrations will have to give you an equilibrium constant of one, right? There's only one way that can happen. You have to end up with the same quantities of starting materials and products. Otherwise, you can't get K as well. Equilibrium eventually looks like A concentration equals B concentration. All right. Can you draw a concentration versus time curve? Can we start with all? Show your neighbor, and then I'll draw it. So, <laughs> okay, when you start with all A. An A. <laughs> what we know at equilibrium is that half of whatever I start with will be used up to make product, right? So we're going to end up halfway. So half of my A can get used up. By the way, that's kind of a wiggly line. What do we know about the slope of this line? The slope, remember the slope reflects the rate. And the rate is going to decrease over time. So it should be steepest at the beginning, and the, and the slope should gradually smoothly decrease. OK, so this is our A curve. What does our B curve look like? Same thing. Okay. What if we start with 100% B? Same thing, but backwards, right? Our B gets used up. And our A gets produced. Yeah. Okay. Lost my clicker. If we start with one molar of A, 
reaction moves towards equilibrium, what will be the sign of delta G? Can you write a rice table for this? What does rice table look like? A rice table would look like this. A goes to B, initial conditions. We start with all starting material. What's Q compared to K? Hi. You sure? <laughs> it's gonna get it reversed, isn't it? Yeah. I love that about this class. Every question, there's like 17 ways to accidentally flip through. <laughs> okay, so if we start with all A, what's our, our initial Q value? So a reaction is gonna move forward. It's gonna look like that. Okay, delta G when we have Q is less than K is gonna be what? Okay, if we start with more B than A, what's the sign of delta G? Delta G has to be positive because the reaction wants to move backwards. So the negative react, the, the reverse reaction is the spontaneous one, which means for the forward reaction that we've written, we can report delta G as positive. Okay, I need you to try to figure out, step back, and try to conceptually see the relationship between Q and delta G naught and delta G. And it helps if you say, what's actually happening here? How would we measure K? Like if you're running a reaction, how do we measure K? Yeah, set up a reaction, let it come to equilibrium, measure the equilibrium concentrations and take those equilibrium concentrations and use that to calculate K. Okay, one way you could do that is to run a reaction under standard conditions, okay? And that little not sign, that means standard conditions. So what are standard conditions? Take one molar or one atmosphere pressure of everything. Which means you start with an equal mix of starting materials. Okay. If you set up a reaction that way, Equal amounts of starting material and products, they're all at one molar. What's the delta G for that reaction? Delta G naught. So delta G naught is the value of delta G you would get for a reaction. All starting material has the same amount of starting materials and products. Okay. Now, K tells you which side the equilibrium lies on, right? And if we start a standard reaction with equal amounts of starting material and products, does that standard reaction, the sign of delta G naught, does it tell you which way the equilibrium lies? Okay, if we start, we'll, we'll go back to that. Okay. So the standard reaction, the moment it begins, the delta G is the delta G naught. Okay, after the reaction begins and proceeds towards equilibrium, do we have delta G naught anymore? Don't, because what happens to delta G as a reaction progresses? Oh. Changes as it moves towards equilibrium, right? Okay. So the delta G naught, what we're visualizing is a reaction where we have equal amounts of starting material and products, right? When delta G is negative, what does that tell you about that reaction? Those conditions, it wants to move towards product, right? So where will equilibrium lie? To the right, you have more, more product than starting material, right? If delta G naught is positive, or a reaction where we start balance between starting material and products, which way will that reaction move? Left, so where does equilibrium lie? Left. So delta G naught, and the sign of delta G naught tells you which way the reaction will proceed from equal amounts of starting material and products, which is the same thing as telling you which way the equilibrium will lie. 
So if you have a delta G naught value that's negative, where does the equilibrium lie? Right. If you have a delta G naught value that's positive, where does the equilibrium lie? The left. Is that exactly the same information as what Kate tells you? Yeah, it is. It's just expressed in kilojoules per mole instead of being expressed as a K value. Okay, so essentially, this is the reaction that we start with when we're thinking about delta G naught. And we're saying, which way does the reaction move from there? And that tells you where the equilibrium will lie when it comes to equilibrium. So it tells us the same thing. Okay, as K does. Now, delta G naught is like a picture of a certain set of conditions. It's these conditions right here. And so it's a constant. And every reaction has a delta G naught that represents what delta G would be if you set up a reaction under those conditions. Do we usually set up a reaction under those conditions? Hardly ever. For one thing, one molar is such a high concentration that some of those solutions would be thick. And it's expensive, because why would you want to put that much material in? <clears throat> so we don't typically set them up under those conditions, but we do have a delta G naught for each reaction that says, what would delta G be under those conditions? Okay, now we use the delta G naught to compare equilibrium for different reactions. Sometimes we call it the thermodynamic driving force. Why would we use those terms? What would thermodynamic driving force mean? It means how, how much the universe wants to push that reaction forward. If you have a large negative delta G naught, what does it tell you about how much the universe wants that reaction to happen? A lot, right? So we Okay, delta G naught can be governed by that equation. So if you change the temperature, you change the delta G naught. Notice we said delta G naught and K tell you the same thing. Delta G naught equals minus RT natural log of the constant. What's the relevance of those equations? If you change the K value, what happens to the delta G naught? Changes. Okay. So if change the temperature and it changes the K value, if you change the temperature, what's going to happen to the delta G naught value? It changes. Okay. Can we read this? If K is one, what's the sign of delta G naught? What's the value of delta G naught? Take the natural log of one. What's the natural log of one? Zero. So a delta G naught of zero means the K is one. Or if you start under standard conditions where all products and starting materials are one molar, you're already at equilibrium. So both delta G naught and K are constants that compare how favorable a reaction to where the equilibrium lies. Yeah. With like differences in like stoichiometry, like let's say A has no coefficient, that's two. Even if all concentrations were the same, then K wouldn't be one. That's why we define the standard state as one, because then <coughs> coefficients don't matter. That's why we chose that as our standard state. So the concentrations wouldn't be the same. In that case, when k equals one, not necessarily when they came to the room, right? Okay, so what describes a reaction that comes to equilibrium with a lot of product? What do we know about k? It's big, right? What do we know about and and much greater than one? What do we know about delta g naught under those conditions? Less than Okay, so when k is a number bigger than one, what's the natural log of a number bigger than one? What's the sign of that number? Careful. So the natural log essentially tells you how many decimal places you have in front of or behind zero. So like if you take the natural log of 0.1, you're going to end up with, well, not exactly. <coughs> Logarithms have to do with the number of decimal places. 
So if you have a number that's 0.1 and take the base 10 log of that, that would be minus one because you move the decimal place in minus one position. Okay, so if you have a big number that's 10, 20, 30, 500 times larger than one, when you take the natural log of it, you're going to end up with a positive value. So large K, take the natural log of, you get a positive value. What's the sign of delta G naught? Negative. If you have a small K less than one, take the natural log of that. What's the sign of the resulting value? Positive. So what? Negative. If you take the natural log of a fraction less than one, then the sign of that is going to be neg negative. So what's, what will the sign of delta G not be? Positive. Okay. So mathematically, this says K is, how about when equilibrium lies to the right, K is large, natural log of K is going to be positive. What's the sign of delta G not? Negative. When equilibrium lies to the left, what will your K value be? Small. So your natural log of K will be negative. So what will the sign of your delta G not be? Positive. Okay. So a reaction that reaches equilibrium with a lot of product is going to have a large K value and a negative delta G not value. A reaction that reaches equilibrium with not very much product and mostly starting material will have a K value less than one and a delta G naught value that is positive. Okay, so those numbers for delta G naught and K, they have a specific conceptual meaning. I'm not above handing you a multiple choice question that looks like you have to do a whole bunch of calculating. The choices are, you can just look at the sign and magnitude of K and delta G naught rule out all the wrong answers and not have to calculate at all. <laughs> and you get rewarded for knowing what the numbers mean by not having to do the yeah, calculate. Okay, so we already said <laughs> that when Q is less than K, what's the sign of delta G? If Q is less than K, what do we need more of? Product. So what's the sign of delta G? Negative. Okay. And when Q, when Q is greater than K, what do we have too much of? So the reaction has to move backwards to get to equilibrium. So what's the sign of delta G? Okay. So we have an equation that says the same thing. We can calculate the value of delta G by comparing the K value value according to this equation. Now, we already know that this minus RT natural log of K is delta G naught. So we can take this equation and also express it in this form. These are the same equations, just sometimes we express delta G naught as minus RT natural log of K, and sometimes we express delta G naught as delta G naught. Looks like two different equations, it's really the same one. Okay, so this equation tells you what you already know. The sign of delta G tells you the, the direction the reaction will move, and that's governed by the difference between Q and K. This is just a mathematical expression of Le Chatelier's principle, isn't it? Okay, that also says the actual value of delta G for a reaction under a given set of conditions doesn't depend on where the equilibrium lies. It depends on where you are compared to the equilibrium. So you can have any value of delta G naught as long as Q is less than K and the reaction will still move forward. I just realized I am. We're almost. There is a subset of you who actually calculating will help. So let's take this equation. Let's assume that K is 10. Think to yourself with your calculator that the equation tells you what you already know. 
Q is two. So Q is two. What does that tell us about what concentrations we have? A is 10, Q is two. What do we know? We have too much reactant and or not enough product, right? So which way will the reaction need to go to reach equilibrium? To the right. So what should the sign of delta G be? Negative. Okay. Plug the numbers in. What do you get? You actually don't even have to plug them in. Natural log of 10 is going to be bigger than natural log of 2, right? Both of them are positive. When you add them together, you end up with a negative number. Okay. How about if Q is 20? If Q is 20, what do we have? Much product and or not enough reactant. So what, how is the system going to have to respond to those conditions? It has to use up product to get to more starting material until it gets equilibrium. So the reaction is going to have to move backwards. So what should the sign of delta G be? The number is sign of RT natural log of 10 is plus 2 value minus plus RT natural log of 20 is it? So Q is 10, we're taking minus RT natural log of 10. Oh my goodness, there's a natural log of 10. Can you see why calculus class could make me cry? <laughs> All it takes is one of those mistakes and then you get the wrong answer. So if you're in a position where you go, I'm going to make mistakes. At least I can see how that. Okay. When Q is K, what's the sign of what is delta G? Zero. Um, if we were going to actually calculate the number, would we need the temperature? We would need the temperature, right? So we would have to tell you what the temperature was. And what's the R? It's the value of the gas constant. But what units do we want for delta G? Kilojoules. Yeah, delta G is expressed in energy units, so joules. So the R value that we need would be the 8.301 joules per mole Kelvin. Yeah. Whatever the other digits are. <laughs> on an exam, how would you know what R was? Given G. It's given on the equation. G. Now, if you want to memorize 16 digits of R so that you can feel superior, Feel free to do it, but you don't actually have to. Okay, can you tell your number, your neighbor? What's the difference between delta G and delta G naught? So explain what each of them is. Why are they different? When do each of them apply? If you can, in your mind, consider that delta G naught and delta G are actually two different categories. That's hard to do when they look the same, except for the little knot. But they're actually two very different things. Okay. Now that. When can delta G equal delta G naught? So I, I told you that if we set up a, a reaction under standard conditions where everything is one molar at the starting conditions, that delta G value is a delta G naught value. Mathematically, when does delta G equal delta G naught? It's when the second term is zero. When is the second term zero? Anytime Q is one. That's why we chose standard conditions where everything was one, because it makes the math a lot easier. Okay, so if we start with all one molar concentrations, that's the starting conditions for a standard reaction. And then delta G with delta G naught. Can we pass through a condition on our way to equilibrium 
sometimes. Okay. I realized that I didn't pick up the recitations and they should be downstairs in my box. Good time to take a break. Okay. So we talked in words about how the relationship between Q and K determined which way the reaction will move, right? And then we had the equations that we just talked about and that you did in recitation that say the same thing in math. How would you present that same set of ideas in picture? And that's what the plot of G versus percent composition does. We introduced this plot last time, but now put it into context with this equation. Okay. Y axis is G, right? Do we actually care about the value for G? What do we care about? We care about delta G. So it's a slope that matters, right? Okay, X axis, sometimes called percent composition. At the X origin here, we would say 100% starting material, so pure reactants. At the other end, it would be 100% products. This plot does not show what a reaction does over time. What this plot shows by the slope is all the different values of delta G that you would get for all different components of the starting materials and products. First thing, the slope equals zero point. What does that tell you? That's where delta G is zero, so that's where you So I read down to the percentage composition occurs at that point. Does that give you some idea about K? Tell me neighbor what a guess value is for what K is here. We're at. Assuming that all the stoichiometries for the reactions is one, this is about 50% A, uh, starting material, 50% product, right? So this corresponds to about a K value equal one. Okay. If I move to the left of the equilibrium point, what are all those values of Q that are coded for by every position on the x-axis? Delta G is negative for all of these points, right? So what does that tell you about Q versus K? Q less than K. So everywhere to the left of the equilibrium point, <coughs> Essentially, all the values of Q less than K correspond to each Okay, what does that show you? Everywhere to this side, we don't have enough product yet. We're still left to the equilibrium once the sun is down. We know this is a negative slope. Down, right? Okay. If we have a higher percent composition, then you would get an equilibrium. What would the delta G for the forward reaction be? Because that would be moving this direction. But at that position, what's the delta G for the backwards reaction? Negative. This plot, if you picture form, what the equation says and what you already know about the direction of reaction. So this is one way of visualizing all the concepts. Okay. So here we have G versus G versus percentage composition. A lot is possible. Oh, A is why isn't B possible? It says delta G is zero right here. Everywhere that has more starting material than that would have positive delta G backwards. Okay, for this plot, let's I want to talk about the Van Hoff equation and then go back to the recitation. Okay, so you believe me that K changes with temperature, right? If K changes with temperature, what does that mean about delta G naught? Did it also change with temperature? It has to, 
because K and delta G naught are flip sides of the same coin. They're different ways of expressing the same thing. So if K changes, delta G naught has. Okay. Why does temperature alter K? If we look at, here's an endothermic energy diagram. Where does the equilibrium constant come from for a diagram like this? What's the connection between the forward and reverse rate constants and the equilibrium constant? So if we take the forward rate constant, divide it by the reverse rate constant, what do we get? Get the equilibrium constant, right? Okay. When we change the temperature, change the forward and reverse rate constants. We do according to the Arrhenius equation, right? And, and the, the <clears throat> amount that the rate constant changes depends on <coughs> the energy ventilation, right? Because we have this Arrhenius equation. Okay, if the energy ventilation is bigger, if the change in favor to change the temperature or a smaller change in the world. So it's bigger change in case. Yeah. Okay. Which means if we look at an energy diagram, when we change the temperature, it's going to have the biggest effect on the direction with the highest energy of activation. So for this endothermic energy diagram, what's the hardest step? Like if we're going forwards or backwards, what's going to be the one with the, the highest rate constant? Well, the highest rate constant is going to be backwards, but the forward one has the highest energy of activation. Right? So the hardest step to accomplish as far as the reaction is concerned, in terms of the, con of the, of the race, is the forward step, right? So the forward step is, is kind of the barrier. If we raise the temperature, what's it going to make the biggest difference to? It's going to make the biggest difference to the forward reaction, okay? So the forward, re re the forward rate constant is going to increase more when we increase the temperature, then the reverse rate constant. So what's gonna to happen to the equilibrium constant as we raise the temperature? A lot, of, a lot of conceptual steps, right? It's gonna go up, okay? When we raise the temperature, we're gonna make it easier for the molecules to go forward. To make the biggest difference to how hard it is for those molecules to move in the forward direction, which is going to increase the forward rate constant more than it has an impact on the reverse rate constant, which is going to translate into an equilibrium constant that goes up. The opposite would be true for an x. <clears throat> okay, so since our equilibrium constant equals the ratios of the forwards and reverse rate constants, then whatever step forwards or backwards has the highest energy of activation, that K value is going to increase the most. Okay, so an endothermic reaction, which K is going to change the most? Forward. Forward. So when you raise the temperature, what happens to K? If you have an exothermic process, inverse of that, I should have both of those on, which one is going to change the most? Reverse. So what happens to K? Goes down. Is it any harder than that? Not really, no. Okay, so conceptually, in these relationships, that tells you what Le Chatelier would have predicted, right? It tells you whether the equilibrium constant goes up or down when you increase the temperature. But physical chemists always want to know not just the trend, but a quantitative prediction of what the value will actually be. So then we need to calculate it. In order to calculate it, we need to come up with an equation that expresses the equilibrium constant as a function of temperature, right? When a physical chemist or a physicist or any kind of math-based scientist wants an equation, for example, how does K change with temperature? What do you do? Better? Make it a line. Well, eventually, fundamentally, all we need is to have equilibrium constant on one side of the react of an equation and temperature on the other. Do we need anything else other than that? 
That's all we need. Okay. So we have two equations. One has K in it. One has whether the reaction is endothermic or exothermic and temperature. Okay. If we're messing with these equations to try to put K on one side and temperature on the other, put the two equations together. Are we there yet? Now we get temperature on both sides of the equation. How will we fix that? By both sides, by minus RT. By both sides, by RT. Now do we have an equation that makes K as a function of temperature? It's still kind of ugly, right? So we can simplify it a little bit and we get this equation. So in the reading, we talked about the Van Hoff equation and all the Van Hoff equation is, some equations you already know, rearranged so that we have K on one side, Y axis, like on the Y value and temperature is your X, okay? Except we have expressed it in the form of a line, right? This isn't that what we always do? in the form of a line so it's easy to plot and think about. So in this equation of a line, our y value is natural log of k. And our x value is 1 over n. So this equation is really minus delta h naught over r times 1 over temperature. And then our intercept is delta s naught over r. OK. <coughs> Why would we want this equation? We talked about the fact if we know if something if the reaction is endothermic or exothermic, that's going to change what happens to K when you change the temperature, right? This equation says the same thing. We're expressing what happens to K as a function of what the sign of delta H is for the reaction. Delta H. Okay. Of course, we don't have an equation particularly in the form of a line unless we're planning to plot data according to that equation right what if i want to know what delta h not in the reaction so for example as part of my dissertation research i was studying the thermodynamics of interaction between Single-stranded DNA of different compositions and <clears throat> antibodies from lupus-prone mice that bound single-stranded DNA. It was a model for lupus in some respects. Okay, but the question is, what's the enthalpy of the reaction? Why would I care what the enthalpy of the reaction would be of the interaction? Why would the delta H matter? That tells you if it's endo or exothermic, right? It tells you if it's endo or exothermic. And actually, you can correlate that to the kinds of intermolecular forces and their strength that operate. So it's actually, there's a lot of physical meaning associated with that. OK. If I measure K at a bunch of different temperatures, could I get the delta H naught for the reaction? Could I get the delta S naught for the reaction? Yeah. Now, there's not that many ways that scientists can actually measure whether a reaction is exothermic or endothermic. And in Chem 105, we talked about using calorimetry to do that, right? And calorimetry works really well, but calorimeters are really expensive and you need a heck of a lot of material because they're not that sensitive. So you have to use a ton of material and high concentrations in order to do a calorimetric measurement. I was using single-stranded DNA that we had, single-stranded DNA and antibodies that we literally had to torture mice to get. That was the existing technology at the time. We didn't know how to make antibodies without having mice grow them. So we, yeah, we put a, a tumor that produced the antibodies in the, in the abdominal cavity of the mouse and the mouse grew the tumor and I didn't do it, but somebody else would put a needle in and suck out the stuff as the tumor group. Okay, the point is, we didn't want to do calorimetry because it was hard to get material and it tortured mice. And we didn't want to have to do that more than we had to, right? So we need another way to calculate delta H. How did we do it? Using a Van Hoff plot. Because if you can measure the equilibrium constant, a bunch of temperatures, how do we do that? run the reaction, the same reaction at a whole bunch of different temperatures, measure the equilibrium concentrations, use that to get your K value. 
plot natural log of the resulting k value over one over the temperature, what does the slope give you? It gives you your delta H value. It tells you whether it's exothermic or endothermic. So is that a tricky mathematical way to get around having to do calorimetry? Absolutely. Okay. Think about this equation mathematically. When endothermic reaction, so you know from Le Chatelier's principle, for an endothermic reaction, heat acts like a reactant, increase the temperature, what's going to happen to the K value? Think it through. This is one of those 17 flip points, right? It's going to go up. So for an endothermic reaction, According to Le Chatelier's principle, heat acts like a reactant. So if you raise the temperature, it's like adding more heat, pushes the reaction to the right, K goes up. It's a lot easier to read that mathematically. Okay. For an endothermic reaction, what's the sign of delta H? It's positive. So as the temperature goes up, what happens to K? Okay. It's easier if we read it on the plot. Let's draw the plot. Okay. If our delta H naught is positive, that's an endothermic reaction, right? So from the Chatelier's principle, we should know that temperature goes up and the K goes up for an endothermic reaction, right? Let's write the equation. For an endothermic reaction, as the temperature goes up on the x-axis, let's just do the x-axis. Higher temperature is at which end of the x-axis? So as temperature goes up, what happens to 1 over t? It gets smaller. Okay, so. According to a Van Hoff plot, high temperature is here, low temperature is farther on. Okay, endothermic goes up, temperature goes up. So where's the higher K value here? Which end? The higher the temperature, the higher the K. What does that mean about natural log of K? It's also higher, okay? So what's gonna happen? my natural log of k or my k values as the temperature goes down. The temperature is going down this way. This way. Temperature goes up. Okay, so as the temperature goes up, we're going to move from right to left, right? What's going to happen to my natural log of k? We end up with a negative slope. So the slope here is minus delta H naught over R, right? Which means for an endothermic process, if delta H naught is positive, the slope is negative, right? So from the slope of a Van Hoff plot, say this is a negative slope. If you only get a negative slope, what's the sign of delta H naught? Positive, which is what? Exothermic or endothermic? Endothermic. endothermic. So you can do the same thing here. Instead of just doing this Le Chatelier, I memorized what the trend is. Get it from the equation and the slope. Okay, so what would an exothermic one look like? 
exothermic delta H naught is what? It's a sign of it. It's negative. Okay, so we have our equation. Natural log of K was minus delta H naught over R times our X value, one over T, delta S naught over R. Okay, if delta H is negative, <laughs> what's slope look like for a plot of natural log of K, K versus one over T? Delta H naught is negative. What's the slope? It has to be positive because the slope is the negative of delta H naught over R, right? Okay, so you can, from the equation, draw the Van Hoff plot with the appropriate curve and the slope. Okay, so then from the plot, what happens to K as the temperature goes up? For an exothermic process. So temperature goes up, right to left, right? And what happens to K as the temperature goes up? It goes down. down. In 107, some of you have a lab where the concentration of products goes up when the temperature goes down, right? If the concentration of products goes up, what's happening to K? As the temperature goes down, what's happening to K? Going up, which means you're moving this way on this plot. It's an exothermic. Is that about 16 million connections at once? Yeah. So your challenge is to go home and think about what does the math say? Can I read the plot? Can I read the slope of the plot? Tell me whether the sign of delta H not positive. Okay, evaluate it for your neighbor. Which one is it? Which Van Hoff plot reflects an exothermic process and which one reflects an endothermic process? And how can you tell from the equation? So, if you're really on a roll, connect it to Le Chatelier's principle. I know that delta H naught has to be negative, so that's exothermic, right? Mm -hmm. So what happens in an exothermic reaction when you raise the temperature? Can I check off the plot that that's true? So when I raise the temperature, I'm moving right to left on the x-axis, so what happens to the K value? Down. Whereas for an endothermic process, as temperature goes up, I'm moving backwards, right? What happens to K? It goes up. So in your 107 class, when the concentration of products went up when temperature went down, that meant K went up when temperature went down. Which of these corresponds to K going up as temperature goes down? This one. What's the sign of delta H? It has to be negative. Okay, now, the Chatelier's principle sounds easier to think about. You don't have to look at equations and you don't have to look at graphs. The problem is 
that when we're analyzing Le Chatelier's principle, if temperature can go up or down and heat can go up or down, and we have to reason through that while someone is blowing their nose in the testing center across from you, <laughs> what are chances that you're actually going to complete that whole thought process without reversing it? And so, <laughs> you're able to say this is what the plot would look like track what's happening as the temperature goes up or goes down and connect it to the equation it actually is a more reliable way to do it because you don't have to hold quite as many things in your head at once because they're on the page instead if you can just read what the plot says <laughs> okay what's the difference between this equation and Le Chatelier's principle the only difference is the equation of the line lets you predict exactly how much the K value will change when you change the temperature. So There's an extra layer of information. Okay. So can we say if a positive slope means a negative delta H, can we say the more positive the slope, the more exothermic the reaction? Or the more negative the slope, the more endothermic the reaction. Here's some data that I found online. It's kind of an interesting thing for this particular process. <laughs> this process can go through two different mechanisms. And once you get to a certain temperature, the slope changes. So what does that tell you? tells you that the delta H naught for the reaction has to change, which means the mechanism has to change. Okay, so we have two different mechanisms here, and then one at lower temperatures here. Um, which one has the more negative delta H? So the slope is equal to negative delta H naught over R, right? So the steeper the slope, what does that tell you about the magnitude of delta H? And it increases. Okay. And the slope is positive, so we're talking about minus delta H instead of positive delta H. So whatever the process is, the mechanism that occurs here, which is at lower temperature, is more exothermic. And if you're an actual biochemist, you would read the magnitude of the delta H to reflect, say, the strength of the intermolecular interactions going on. There's, there's actual physical uh, meanings for things that can give a different value to delta H. Okay, so the Van Hoff plot says how much does temperature alter K, right? The delta G naught is minus RT log of K, natural log of K. If you change the temperature, what happens to delta G naught? It also changes, right? They both change. So just like there's a unique value of the equilibrium constant at each temperature, there is a unique value of delta G naught at each temperature. Okay, so now make another connection. So K changes when the temperature changes, and we can use the Van Hoff equation to predict the direction of the change. What will happen to delta G naught as the temperature goes up for an endothermic reaction and for an exothermic reaction? So I'm asking you to chart all the connections in your brain in order to make that connection. So when K goes up, what happens to delta G naught? When K goes up, delta G naught becomes more negative. negative. Right. Okay. So for an endothermic reaction, as temperature goes up, what happens to K? K goes up. So what happens to delta G? Becomes more negative. Or just say more negative, which means it could be positive and become less positive, or it can be negative and become more negative, right? Okay, for an exothermic reaction, track it through. For an exothermic reaction, temperature goes up, it goes down. So what happens to delta G naught? 
Sometimes less negative, more positive. <laughs> That's a classic kind of test question, right? Where you have to track all the different. <laughs> <laughs> I can show you a Matt Hoff plot and ask you what happens to the sign of delta G naught as the temperature goes up or the temperature goes down. I don't think I've ever asked a question like that. That would be a good one. <laughs> delta G naught doesn't change unless you change the temperature. So delta G naught is a comparison value that doesn't change over the course of a reaction. But if you change the temperature, so the K changes, then delta G naught also changes for the reaction at that temperature. Does that make sense? Yeah. So delta G naught and K are constants at a single temperature. So over the course of a reaction, they don't change. But if we're comparing different temperatures, we do. Okay. Now, one of the things that we want to get out of the Van Hoff plot and how we use it is to get delta H naught, right? No. And that works really well. These are beautiful plots. Um, data points would you have to have collected? How many K values would you have to measure for that plot? So there are 10 different temperatures represented. In actuality, each of those temperatures, you'd probably have to collect three experiments at that temperature. So that plot represents 30 different K measurements. And I would get really good delta H naught and delta S naught values out, which is great. Sometimes all I want to know is, is it exothermic or endothermic? Or I want to know, does it have a huge delta H naught or a small delta H naught? So I don't always need the number for delta H naught to be known as, as well as you'd get from a full on bath. So my graduate advisor used to say, I want it quick and dirty. What do you mean? I just want to know enough to kind of know what's happening and I don't need it to be very precise. So one thing that I can do if I want a quick and dirty measurement of delta H naught, do it by measuring the equilibrium constant at only two temperatures. Do you remember when we did the two point, the two point form of the linear Arrhenius equation, right? Remember the ugly natural log of K1 over K2 equals minus E over R, one over T2 minus T1 and all the different irritating versions of that particular equation. Okay, we're going to now do exactly the same thing that the two equations that we're going to subtract from each other are not the linear form of the Arrhenius equation. They're going to be the Van Hoff equation. So subtract one from the other this way, simplify, and you get an equation that looks an awful lot like the two point form of the Arrhenius equation, except equilibrium constants instead of rate constants. And the slope doesn't reflect the energy of activation, the slope reflects and enthalpy of the reaction, the delta H. Okay, so if you know the equilibrium constant at one temperature and you know the delta H naught value, you can calculate the equilibrium constant at the other temperature. Or if you can measure two equilibrium constants at two different temperatures, you get a quick and dirty estimate of what your delta H naught value is. Does smart work love that kind of question? Yes. Okay, so we have all these equations. There's actually not as many as it looks like, okay? You already knew this equation. That doesn't feel new to you, right? And we know that delta G naught equals minus RT log of K, right? So those are two equations that we need. This one, that's just a real answer of this equation. Okay, have the third equation. Delta G equals minus RT natural log of K plus RT log of Q. If you express that in a different form where the minus RT natural log of K is delta G naught, but that's really the same equation. So now we're up to three equations, right? If you combine this equation and uh, this equation using delta G naught instead, you can come up with the Van Hoff equation. Is this really a new equation? not really a new equation. 
It's just a way of using this equation and this equation together to answer the question of what happens to K as the temperature changes. In this two point form, is that really a new equation? It's just a version of this one. Okay, so the question that students ask is, how do I know which one to use when? Well, it depends what information you have, right? So if you look at the information you're given, one of those equations is going to be more relevant to the information that you have. Okay. In 10 minutes, working on recitation and talking about it, and then one more thing that I need to show you. I don't know if it's always just to do it as much as it's because like it it's showing that so You know how the metacognition videos talked about building a concept map? Connecting all the equations is a good way to build a concept map. You say, what does this equation say? What does it mean? What concepts does it code for? How does it connect to the next equation? What concepts does that code for? That's a good way to build a Okay, did you calculate your concentration? Because <clears throat> no. you can actually oh. use a dice table to come up with exactly what the concentration should be. Okay. <laughs> 
This time is so the slope. This slope is two, and we have to also just at least zero. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, right. I think it's posted by the. 